Service Force, which was uh, granted this award, is the um, the um, one of the uh, most powerful component of the IDF and Israeli society. We lost many reservists who fell in action, including Yonatan, the husband of Moran and also the son of Gadi Eisenkot, and we will speak with Gadi Eisenkot later today. We'll remember everybody and wish uh, everybody the best for the, for the injured. The reservists who were discharged and came back from Gaza or the northern border are dealing with many difficulties which were uh, mentioned. Universities, uh, workplaces, families, it's a heavy burden, but we're not going to go into it. Today on stage, we have Yonat Daskal Dagan and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mayor Carmi. You will hear a story of unlimited giving, um, self example, role example. Listen carefully. Meir Karmi is sitting here. He's a married and a father of four daughters, aged 5 to 12, and he is the uh, marketing director of a company. He was a paratrooper, and he has been the commander of Battalion 71 at Brigade 55. On the morning of October 7th, he was at his house at Moshav Yogev. He woke up and he realized pretty soon the magnitude of the situation. He was not waiting for an order. He just kissed his wife and daughters and uh, turned and, and went to his car immediately. While he was driving, he realized what was going on and he called uh, the entire um, battalion. Mayor, tell us what happened in the next two or three days. So first of all, good afternoon. So as you said, we got to Bilu. We uh, convened masses of reservists appeared or soldiers. Uh, immediately and we opened the emergency storage we understood that a major situation was going on in the south usually it takes a lot of time to call all these people but we understood that there was a major event going on and we made a decision to go south we prepared the cars and the two uh, 30 uh, 33 hammers equipped with more than um, 300 uh, um, reservists went to the south. We went to the Gaza envelope. We reached Kfar Aza, where there were major battles. And um, at the entrance to Kfar Aza, we actually divided the responsibilities. And we started the attack at 4.30. It's uh, bizarre to say attack at the kibbutz, but the enemy was there, and we conquered the northern part of the kibbutz. We cleared the houses. We hit the terrorists. And uh, in the, uh, at night, we managed to rescue 50 uh, residents from their houses and evacuate them. On the following two days, we continued uh, clearing house after house in the neighborhood of the young people of the kibbutz. And we cleared the entire space until two days later, we managed to start dealing with uh, evacuating all the casualties and in fact, actually clearing the entire kibbutz. Yonat? Yonat at the Skaldagan, a 33-year-old. She's, um, she's a mother of two children, young children. She was a paramedic at the Nachal Brigade, and, and she's a reservist. She is a dedicated paramedic, and she works at Magen David Adom, MADA, the ambulance ser uh, service. She's a senior at this organization. As a reservist, she used to be in Gaza as part of Protective Edge in 2014. Back then, she was one of four women that went into Gaza. Actually, she was caught by surprise 6.30 in the morning when the radio of Magen David Adom started beeping. She uh, actually left straight away, and the children stayed with her husband, and then her husband was drafted too. 
and then the children moved in with the grandmother. Two days later, uh, uh, she actually uh, drafted as a reservist and she grouped with the Nahal Brigade. She was part of the evacuation force of Battalion 931. She was the only woman in the medical staff and she went into Gaza inside an Eitan, which is an armored uh, vehicle. So um, for two months, so much she spent in Gaza, and I'd like to remind you, it's not only her who is a reservist. Her husband was drafted as well. You not tell us about the warfare in Gaza, how it made you feel, just how you felt just before you entered when you grouped with uh, uh, combat uh, soldiers much younger than you, and you are already a mom. And it's important to say that even this unit, uh, you are part of this unit, and this unit lost even before the entrance to Gaza. They lost the commander of the um, the company commander and other commanders as well. So yes, the. When I realized that uh, war started and we need to go to enter Gaza, it was very difficult for me because I felt that again, as Ariel said, that was my second time that I entered Gaza. But this time I realized that my status was a bit different. I am a mother of two, and this thought uh, always, um, I always thought about it, and Nahal Brigade suffered many casualties on October 7th, so there was this concern that maybe I'm joining a brigade that is in, uh, that, that uh, the people there were not in the best mood, but actually their spirit was very strong and it was amazing and it affected me, and I felt that that was the mission that I had to fulfill, to be the paramedic of the Nahal a brigade because this is what I do as a civilian. This is what I know. And I felt that this is critical mission. That's right, I'm a mom and I, I have two children under my responsibility and my husband was drafted too later on, but I felt that it was my mission and at some place I felt as if I had this double mom position. I felt as if I'm there as a mom as well, as a mom to the uh, amazing soldiers whose mother was of course, not in Gaza, so I served as their mother there. So I cooked for them in the kitchens in Gaza, and I made sure that they brushed their teeth. And um, when it was cold, I actually made sure they had blankets, and I felt that it kept me sane because I really wanted there to eat the pasta I prepared. It's like I do for my children. And it was also a type of a kind of a closure for me because at the end of the day, I left my two kids at home. And I must tell you that the Israel people of Israel were amazing when I went out or when I got to the border. So all of a sudden, I realized that so many good people took my children, mother of soldiers whose son fought in Gaza, the ones who actually watched my children and my mom could rest because at the age of 60 something she wasn't prepared to be a full-time mother so it felt like a closure to me so uh, let's go back to you and now i'd like to mention something that you told me previously that in kfar gaza uh, he was very humble when he told me that almost almost a matter so but, but the battalion was very strong so that's why they succeeded and there was not even a single um, casualty in their uh, battalion so that's the power of this battalion well so you went out from uh, Kfar Gaza you were called to the north and then you went to training in Selim and then you went into Gaza you fought for 55 days in the area of Khan Yunis so tell us a little bit about the battalion and the war in Gaza. So uh, warfare in Gaza, I think that I'm, I represent many battalions that fought in Khan Yunis, in, especially in Brigade 55. We actually took this mission and it's a maneuvering of the division. We went into Khan Yunis. In a couple of hours, we needed to take over and go deep inside. And in this territory, we met what we expected. Uh, many terrorists, uh, multiple infrastructure. For example, there were 
um, more than 60 explosives exploded, many uh, houses filled with explosives. We have encounters with terrorists, and I think that there at the end we saw the spirit of the of the entire IDF and the reservists in particular, and alongside this desire to fight back and to obtain the objectives of war, we also saw the reservists and their ability to learn to change on the go, to become a bit different, to ask questions. And really, uh, as part of the, uh, the many, uh, very frequently I'm asked different questions, whether we are winning, whether we feel as if we're not in such a good place. So I feel that we all should say, and we should not apologize for that, we are winning the war, we are winning the battle. Yeah, they deserve that, definitely. It's true that we remember the hostages, and personally, I've done a lot in this area, and we will do whatever it takes. If they call us back in, we'll do it, but we are winning, and we're going to reach our victory. And when we encounter uh, the enemy, when the commanders are there at the front leading their force, these guys are inside the tunnels, and they and they send their subordinates to fight with us. So it's important to say, and we don't say it uh, uh, enough, when we want, we win. There is nothing that we cannot accomplish. So for me, it's very clear that victory is just around the, the corner. And again, Carmi is being, is being very humble, you know? Um, whoever was in the ADF, you know that you get the decoration after bad things happen. Very unfortunate events, but sometimes um, rewards can, should be given to a battalion that fought for 55 days in Gaza with one casualty and a small number of wounded uh, soldiers. And uh, the cr it's because of the commanders, the commander of the battalion. You're not, you, are, you were there. You fought in Rimal, Shati, Jebel, and the center of Gaza, and northern part of Gaza. Soldiers were killed and injured, and you told me about a very dramatic evacuation. Can you tell us about it? Yes. In one of those days, unfortunately, there was an encounter that caused multiple um, wound, wounded. Most of them were in serious condition, and we uh, reached the wounded soldiers, and I remember that they they open one of the door the doors of the car and they push into many wounded into the cars and I remember the most serious uh, uh, the one who had the most serious injury filled with sweat she was bleeding terribly and um, I remember that I saw that he had many earrings so I realized he was in a reservist and not a, not a conscript so I was trying to reassure him and lift his spirits and I told him it seems to me that you're the only person in Gaza who has more earrings than I do and I was trying to ask him what his name was what he was what what he did so it turned out that he was a student an engineering student I promised me he was about to graduate we treated him and up and up until that if incident, we would actually go on, uh, we fly to the, uh, we will drive to the border and then actually uh, use the helicopters. But then 15 minutes later, after we met with uh, this wounded person, they told me that the helicopter was about to land in Gaza. We were under fire. 18, we spent 18 uh, seconds on ground, and then they pushed the wounded soldier into the helicopter, and there were two people with serious injuries, and, and then we took off on our way to the hospital, and on that week, accidentally, there was my my daughter had her first birthday and it was a bit difficult for me emotionally but on that moment when i put the wounded soldiers into the helicopters there was another encounter right away afterwards with terrorists and it you feel that what you're doing there is so so important and you know that it doesn't really matter what's going on at home you have a role to fulfill we all felt this way and this is what we had to do and for that this is what we've been preparing 
to throughout our lives. So are you in touch with this uh, uh, wounded uh, reservist? Yes, he's in rehabilitation. He was in ICU and then he was transferred to the department. I'm in touch with others as well because I feel that as opposed to my civil profession as a paramedic, there, when I place the patient at the hospital, it ends right there. But here it's a bit different. Uh, the, the soul behaves in a different way. So I feel that it's very, very important to keep in touch with them. It's not, it's not, it doesn't end once you evacuate them. So it's very important for me to get to know them better. And unfortunately, I all also uh, met with people who died afterwards, who did not survive their injuries. But I, um, it was very important for me to actually I looked them up on Google and I read about them about their families because really each one of them is so important and so significant and part of this operation so uh, you, another question that I would like to ask you not during this war as opposed to what happened in protective edge here there were many more women so uh, how about women's solidarity yes wow that's amazing really the, the different amazing things here for example whenever they saw uh, another woman everybody yelled you're not here's another woman here's another woman and it feels as if it was very, I felt very good about it. I felt that uh, usually there were uh, women from paramedics or doctors. So we started speaking. When I started speaking with other women, it doesn't really matter where we were. All of a sudden, it felt as if I was talking to a friend of mine. So I talked to her about life and about nail polish. And it felt so pleasant to see so many women in such high positions. and. Uh, and in, in a moment, we're going to celebrate Women's Day. I wish we wouldn't have to celebrate a Women's Day, but I think that during this war, really, and on October 7th in particular, everybody saw how important women are and the roles that they are able to fulfill. And it's not an issue. In Protective Edge, it was, wow, there was a woman um, there under the helmet. But, but here, it was not an issue. Well, that's another woman. So, okay, so what? Maybe you'll go to the, I don't know, to the restroom together, but that's it. So it wasn't such an issue as it used to be, and I think that we made a lot of progress there. Now, I think that this war made it very, very clear that the roles of women now, should, the women should have equal uh, place. And uh, before I ask May the last question, do you plan to actually serve again as a reservist soon? It depends on who you're asking, whether it's me you're asking, my boss, my husband, or my mom. Well, yes, I'll do it again. We were already summoned. My mom is not aware of it currently, so please don't t tell her. Mail. <laughs> How do you, I know that your battalion, uh, you're going you're gonna to be uh, summoned uh, soon uh, again for many days. You're going to have to be there uh, in the summer. How do you actually um, plan the next step? Well, I feel it's complicated because uh, we were fighting for four months. Uh, we almost did not to spend any time at home, and we were called uh, to serve in the last two weeks of August till September. But we are preparing our equipment, and we want to make sure that we are uh, competent, of course. For us, it's still war, and we don't know when we will be called. And we are also ne need to think about the north. And so we think that if the war developed in the north, we're going to be summoned there as well. And uh, according to the more uh, optimistic scenario, we're going to be called only in August. So we understand what it takes. We understand why we're needed. There's nobody else to do it. And I think that the soldiers matured um, recently. And I think that our society changed as well. And this embrace, we are being embraced. And it's. Um, we are receiving a reward, and it means a lot. So actually, now everybody understands that reservists are very important for the state. And if they need their us, we'll be there.
Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you for uh, joining us today and sharing your amazing stories with us. You deserve a salute.